Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Amir Ifradi. I am an executive editor of a technology news publication called The Information. Uh, we write about we, we do write about uh, restaurant technology and delivery companies and, and so on, uh, among many, many other things. And I'm very, very excited to be here because the topic of the economics and financials of food delivery is among the most de hotly debated areas, uh, certainly that I've come across uh, this year uh, among our subscribers. And we've got uh, a, a very good, pretty representative panel here um, of, of folks in this ecosystem. So it's uh, it's very on point. And I think we're just going to go around and uh, everyone's going to going to spend uh, 30 seconds just introducing themselves and seeing what they do and where they come from and where they're based currently. Um, so we will start with Kelly from Boston. Go for it. Oh, your uh, sound may be off. Oh, your sound is still off, I think. All right, we will go, we will go to Mark in, Mark in the South Bay. Go for it, Mark. Sure, yeah, my name is Mark Ferguson. I'm in uh, here in San Jose, California. Um, I've been a DoorDasher and uh, on a actually on a variety of platforms, uh, sort of specializing in DoorDash for almost a, almost five years now. Um, I have a regular career and a sort of a 95 job here in Silicon Valley. I need to make more money. And uh, I am not, I don't have quite the same verve, uh, you know, to become a, a CEO of Full Kitchen or to become, you know, VP of sales. Um, so I decided to, uh, you know, begin, uh, begin dashing and, and starting right away. So since 2015, you know, I've been paying very close attention on, you know, uh, what it's like to be a good dasher in various ways to you know sort of maximize my time out there and i started writing uh under the name dash bridges uh for harry over at the uh at the ride share guy and um i so i'm looking at things from a dasher's point of view with also some corporate experience myself okay uh kelly i don't know if your audio situation has been fixed uh maybe tell us no you might want to sign out and sign back in again and see how it goes. Uh, Peter, what about you? Go for it. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be on this panel. Um, my name is Peter. I'm the CEO and one of the founders of Full Kitchen. Uh, used to be at Google before that. Uh, and uh, now we're pursuing our passion and trying to bring uh, affordable and convenient food to uh, the world. OK, Nash. Okay. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Uh, my name is Vignesh Ganapathy. I go by Viggy. I head up government relations at Postmates, and I've been at the company for about two and a half years now. Um, most of my background has been in creating um, wholesome communities through public policy. And of course, in the food delivery space, um, since we are touching aspects of our community ranging from our local brick and mortar retailers through individuals who are looking for ways to supplement their income through people who may be homebound or taking care of loved ones that they um, and, and so they're unable to access food and through the same means that others are able to do so. Um, it means that, you know, as we're looking at what is it, it, it needs to be one that includes all of those different populations. Okay. Uh, and Kelly, uh, who will hopefully rejoin us, um, works for a very interesting company that helps restaurants to essentially maximize their real estate by learning how to make food for delivery only uh, and essentially uh, working on very specific kind of food brands that these kitchens can actually make themselves and make the most of uh, of what they have. Um, so that's actually a very interesting area and, and uh, certainly uh, very, very uh, relevant today, uh, still in the, the, the COVID pandemic. So just, just to set up the conversation, I think we can all agree that most restaurants don't want to hire their own drivers. Um, there are plenty of customers and it's a growing number that want to pay for the convenience of having food that's delivered to their home or maybe in the future their office since historically they have been. Um, and so far, you know, restaurants themselves have been willing to pay, you know, a delivery fee uh, or a fee or commission, excuse me, to the delivery apps um, to sell meals that maybe otherwise they wouldn't be selling. Um, and that's, that's obviously gotten very complicated amid this pandemic where you've had a lot of restaurants shut down and um, it's, it's probably been one of the more tragic aspects of this, um, of this whole thing with so many workers going out of business who were previously in that, in that industry 
um, and a lot of entrepreneurs and restaurant owners who are um, just completely out of out of luck there. So um, I don't know if the stat is that maybe 30 percent of restaurants in this country are permanently shut down. It's it's definitely in that 25, 35 kind of range. And, um, uh, you know, that, that's that's not lost on, on anyone here. Um, I think that, uh, you know, one of the one of the questions um, and sort of arguments that's been made is that um, there's a very clear path for delivery companies of all sorts to um, to actually turn a, a profit once they get um, big enough. And, you know, there are all sorts of examples out there um, uh, around the world, uh, including in, in China, of that being possible. Um, of course, the criticism is, is that these delivery apps, and I think Peter may have something to say on this as well, uh, Ignatius especially, uh, is that these are kind of similarly exploitative to, to maybe the, the ride hailing apps in terms of um, maybe not giving the couriers or drivers as much information as they need to know whether they're making a good decision here and understanding things like vehicle depreciation um, and whether they're actually making even minimum wage with what they are doing. So that's that's sort of um, one of the questions that, that continues to be asked. And we've got a proposition in California, for those of you who aren't in California, pretty monumental situation happening on election day where uh, all the delivery apps have put in like $200 million to get this thing passed, which would overturn this law called AB5 uh, that it that requires uh, uh, people like Mark to be employee employees of DoorDash or not at all part of DoorDash. Um, and so we're going to talk about all these things. I'll, I'll stop rambling, but um, very quickly, just at a high level in terms of financials, maybe I'll start with Ignesh because you guys just revealed your uh, not all of your uh, financial data, but at least some of your financial data uh, as far to, as far as the uh, um, as part of the Uber acquisition. So we know that, um, especially in the second quarter of this year, Postmates was able to cut its burn, its cash burn significantly, um, while still growing. So I think it speaks to, to you know the, the trends that we were just talking about. But, but Vignesh, do you, do you think that the, the, the broad question of whether these services can make money has been, is sort of done and dusted, or is it still an open question? I think right now, as we look at the entire ecosystem, um, you mentioned that size is directly re related to whether these companies are able to turn a profit. Um, but I want to be a little bit more specific about how that happens. Um, ultimately, um, each one of these businesses uses kind of a, fly, a flywheel economics model. So in essence, if you have more restaurants on the platform, more customers will order from them and more individuals will try and work on these platforms. So across the board, you'll see increases. The way that that leads to being able to build a profit is that you're able to do more deliveries within a shorter amount of time. So um, on our platform, our engineers spend a lot of time trying to make sure that um, the Postmates fleet is able to do um, up, you know, close to three deliveries per hour if possible, um, because that, you know, it's a, uh, it's a way of ensuring that individuals are able to work consistently. Um, you know, their earnings go up in turn if there are more jobs that are available on the platform. Um, but additionally, um, that way we're able to take multiple orders that um, would traditionally happen separately and be able to um, bash them together and, and do them as a sequence, uh, creating um, many more deliveries in a shorter amount of time. And what's your response to the, the you know, allegations that your service and others like it are, are exploitative and need uh, need serious reform? So, you know, I, I think as we look at that specific question, um, it, you know, much of this is really, um, really informed by the last hundred years of labor law, which is a bigger discussion than we're going to be talking about here. Um, but in many ways, our current labor and employment system was really designed to protect workers who are working within factories and in these sort of traditional labor relationships in which someone would work their entire career at GM, for example, and then retire from that same employer. That has some upside, but it also has some tremendous downside. When I graduated college, if I was $200 short on rent, there were very few places for me to go to actually earn money instantaneously. I would have to go scour Craigslist, seeing what part-time jobs or et cetera was available. Um, and you know, now you can download an app and you can find work without having to have a traditionally wedded labor relationship to your employer. 
That of course means that in order to do that, you're using an, a, a classification of work that doesn't come with a sort of traditional world of benefits. But what's happened is we started to look at this sort of like a bifurcated problem where, where you know, there's a, there's one side that argues that, look, like we need to return to a world in which you have one employer. One employer ought to be enough. But for many people who work on the Postmates platform, they aren't looking necessarily to be a career for life. Um, and I think Mark will be able to speak a little bit to what the workforce ends up ends up looking like in this space. But there are individuals who are working part time jobs, people who may be a parent who's trying to supplement the income within their home. And for those individuals, they're looking for ways to add to their household income. Um, you know, if you're able to do a job between when you get off of your traditional work and picking up your kid from daycare, there's value to that. At the same time, I think when we start thinking about ways to support workers in this space, um, we need to figure out how to take those sort of traditional benefits and try and port them over to a world in which someone may have multiple employers. So if you're working upwards of 35 hours a week, but you're working on multiple platforms or have a part-time job in addition to that, you're working 35 hours. If that was one job, you would probably have a healthcare plan. But now, even if you're an employee, you're not getting a healthcare plan from any of those employers. So how can we start to decouple that benefits allocation from that individual job? And that's really, I think, the long-term project of this question. Um, well, I, th I think, I mean, I think I, I want to move to Mark for a second because I think that the cynical take on this is that the economics of these businesses are so challenged that it has taken this significant regulatory or legislative threat, um, which would have, it seems, a very material impact on, on Postmates um, uh, in order to get Postmates and everyone else to come to the table with more benefits to offer to, to these people who, who don't have these these safety nets. Um, so Mark, how do you, what what do you think about that? Um, is that, I mean, I know that you, you've expressed some optimism around the, the business model and the, um, the ability of these platforms as they get bigger to just be more efficient and make it easier for you uh, to, to earn more as well. Um, so, can you can you speak to some of this? Yeah, certainly, and uh, and I really understand you know Vicky's um, uh, you know discussion about um, you know when you have a part time job and you know for me you know my situation was exactly as you described for someone who you know does this part time and I would say somewhere between twelve and eighteen hours a week I would you know be at my regular uh, day job and then you know on uh, for dinners you know. With, for, from say five to eight thirty at night, and then you know throughout Sunday, uh, tip you always want to dash or uh, run Postmates during football Sundays. It's uh, you're always going to be busy. So um, and so you know for me earning that extra money, and I would I would uh, gross about twenty dollars an hour, which was okay, which was fine, you know for me. Um, my concern about that is that uh, you, you know. A lot of times, you know, these types of platforms are promoted as something or you have um, uh, 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 benefits or bonuses where, you know, you need to work maybe 30 hours a week to earn a certain bonus. Uh, and, you know, with things like, you know, Uber and Lyft where they would have, um, you know, where you can rent a car for them and it's sort of expressed as a way where you can earn a living doing this job where, you know, the first 12 to 18 hours are relatively, you know, simple and you can kind of handpick the most, the busiest times when you, you know, to deliver. But when you go from 18 hours up to 35 hours to 40 hours, um, you know, it gets, you know, it becomes much more rough sledding, you know, as far as trying to earn money. Um, you know, again, I'm using my own equipment, my own car, my own gas, my own, um, again, depreciation, et cetera. Um, and so there's a lot of responsibility sort of on the backs of, of uh, you know, drivers and, and delivery people. Um, but, and so, you know, again, I really found it convenient and helpful and enjoyable as sort of a counterpoint to, you know, a desk job with, with spreadsheets, et cetera. Um, but, you know, if you're sort of an unskilled, you know, worker and you're, and you're driving and, you know, there's really not a career here. And I think sometimes you can get sucked into the idea, of, you know, because you have to make rent, you have to, you know, you have to eat. Um, you get kind of sucked into, you know, the immediate payouts. And, um, you know, again, it's really difficult for, um, you know, to, to make a living, you know, doing this full time. 
So, uh, and b before, uh, before we move on to Peter, I, I should mention uh, we've got a couple of commenters already. So please feel free to ask questions as you think of them and we will uh, see these questions and, and be able to respond to them uh, or comments are fine too. Um, Peter, you, you see some problems with the status quo, right? You don't like, uh, you, you don't like the existing uh, delivery apps that are there and, and you're trying to do something different. Um, so tell us, tell us what's wrong. So uh, ultimately, the enough demand to make the uh, economics work argument, unfortunately, can easily break down, right? If you look at the current state of affairs, the delivery food, there is uh, so much cost involved, even at the uh, target that is unreachable currently of three deliveries per hour per uh, driver. Um, that uh, a big chunk of the population is simply priced out of the food. And so you end up in this sort of catch-22 situation where, you know, it would be great to have the demand, uh, but you can't have the demand because the prices are too high and you just can't exit uh, this uh, point uh, that uh, the food delivery companies are in, in the United States. Uh, ultimately, that is exactly why we started our company. Um, and uh, started looking for different efficiencies in the ecosystem beyond uh, just what the typical delivery company can optimize, which is trying to batch more rides for a single order. And you have to start looking towards the places where the food is actually manufactured by the restaurants, because if you keep cutting into their prices uh, to bring down the cost low enough for the consumer for them for it to make sense to even get delivery food, then you're pricing them out of the equation and they don't make enough money to survive, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, but, but just, just, just to be clear, and I, this is a great segue into, into Kelly if her, if her audio is working, but, but Peter, are you saying that um, Postmates, Uber, even DoorDash, um, Waiter and, and some of these others, they're, not, they're just not gonna be able to turn a profit? Yeah, they, their model is fundamentally flawed? Is that what you're saying? I think unless uh, it becomes an actual monopoly in the United States where uh, the, all the companies join into a single uh, entity, it will be very, very difficult. Uh, there is still sort of parts and pockets of their business that can be profitable, but they happen to be around the luxury customers, the higher end customers. Everything else is incredibly difficult to make work and goes against the narrative that they're telling that we are going right. to grow in size. And as soon as we have the concentrated demand, our business model will flip to profitable. But, but, but the, the, so I agree with you. I don't think anyone will argue these are luxury services uh, for, the, for the customers. Um, and, and the same goes with ride hailing, right? Taking an Uber. It's not cheap. Um, it, it, and it was certainly subsidized for a long time. Um, these are luxuries, but like, so, so is an iPhone, right? And, and enough people will, will sometimes want something if it has, if it gives them enough value or, or utility or it saves them time or it saves them whatever it is. So it, could it be that you're just underestimating people's ability to afford this luxury? Could you be wrong? I think iPhones and buying food are generally very difficult, different products, right? The truth is that as you keep moving to the uh, different segments of society, the opportunity cost of your time changes entirely, which is a big question in terms of the amount of money that you're willing to spend on outsourcing your daily cooking to someone else, right? Uh, and uh, it's something that we see during the pandemic as well, that uh, you know the economics have become better because a lot of the fine dining has actually shifted towards uh, food delivery because you cannot go out. Uh, but ultimately, that is just an illusion of a reality. The truth is, again, that if you want to do even more deliveries per hour, you need very, very dense set of customers. And you can either make it work in very specific neighborhoods that have tons of rich people living, or um, the story that you're telling just breaks down because the cost is too high for most people. So Ke Kelly, does your, does your audio work hopefully? Maybe, Kelly, are you? I don't know, we'll see. Yeah. Are we back oh. in? You're in. Yay, okay. rookie move, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, 
again, we're, we're obviously there are three three critical parts of of, of this story, um, right? There's the, the app marketplace. There's the the, the buyer. I should four the buyer, the, the courier, and then the restaurant. Um, so four parties here, and you can certainly speak to the to the restaurant side. Um, assuming you've listened to this conversation so far, uh, there there are clearly some differences of opinion, a lot of differences of opinion. Um, what uh, what's your point of view, and what's the point of view of of restaurants and how they play in this ecosystem in the long term? For whom does this work? For whom does this not work? Um, what what does the pandemic mean? I'm assuming it's been a very very good for your uh, for your service as well uh, to to help restaurants be able to participate uh, if they if they weren't already and get get that extra revenue. But um, but yeah, t t talk to us about it in, in these terms. Like what what are the economics of these? Uh, uh, of these businesses, um, are they sustainable? Are they not? What's the perspective of the, of the restaurant tour? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, with the pandemic, it has definitely, we've obviously, we've seen a shift um, to an increase of people trying out the apps for the first time um, and trying it for pickup, trying it for delivery. Um, we've seen a whole new set of couriers coming into our restaurants. Um, and so as a restaurant, we, you know, we, you have to really adapt to that um, and sort of develop those new systems and process. And um, you can't look past any of them because that could be a customer that you're potentially looking past, I would say. And so from the virtual brand standpoint, it's, you know, providing these restaurants with an opportunity to get, you know, one more order through their doors. Um, it's the opportunity to get one more courier through their doors, picking up one or two different orders. Um, so it really helps them with sort of the, uh, you know, the scalability of it, of making up for potentially some of that lost revenue that they're not able to achieve because their dining room's closed or they're at that 25% capacity. Um, so I think from the restaurant's perspective, uh, you know, we're almost aiding in sort of providing additional, uh, you know, pickup opportunities for these couriers um, so that they can be generating more revenue. And perhaps they would be picking up two orders where they can do four orders in an hour as opposed to that three or um, really being able to scale it from that standpoint. So I, I do see the virtual brands as being sort of an asset to these third party delivery companies, as well as the couriers that are out in the field. Um, anything to give them an ever, another opportunity to be able to make a delivery um, I, I think is a win. But what's the long term here? I mean, uh, th there have been, uh, you know, complaints here and there from restaurants about commissions. There have been some uh, commission caps instituted during this pandemic period in some cities. Um, so what what does this relationship look like long term? Um, I guess it really depends on the type of restaurant. But um, but uh, but are these you know, you're saying that this is a critical period of time where restaurants need to do this. Are they going to want to do this in the long run? I think uh, the, the restaurants will always want to be making more money. Um, I think that that's one of the, uh, you know, that's how this delivery business, I think, evolved in the restaurant industry is that they were always looking for where do I get the, that next three orders, that next four orders, that next five orders. So I do believe that, uh, you know, pandemic aside, I think the delivery business and uh, it is here to stay. Um, I do think it will continue to evolve from a commission standpoint, from a structure standpoint. Um, because there's profitability in all of it. Um, you know, we spoke about it, it's being sort of this luxury service of having food delivered and and it is. And it's something that people, I, I think, have grown to love of getting their food delivered over the past few months. Um, and, and I do think they will continue to want to pay to have that service. Um, and once you sort of break down the logistics of it, um, there is a fee for every sort of part of the process um, that unfortunately you can't necessarily eliminate. So it will be about sort of optimizing it, uh, but it's here to stay for sure. Okay, so going back to, to Vignesh, I mean, um, you, you heard all of Peter's criticisms uh, about the, the business model. And it's amazing that, we, you know, this still is an unresolved thing um, in, 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 in some people's minds. I mean, again, I, I always come back to, to Uber, which is going to be your parent company soon, you know, next year. Um, and, and look at the ride hailing business, which again is a luxury and they've been raising prices or give them the ability to, to turn a profit. Um, uh, you know, but a lot of people were doubting, doubting Uber for a long time on that front. And I think they've almost answered that question. Uh, at least they're, they're starting to, uh, given the pre-pandemic uh, uh, progress that they had. 
So do you think that there's, I mean, I don't know if, you, if you've crunched the math on this um, in your government relations role, but um, does, it, does it surprise you that, that the debate still continues and, and you've got Peter here, um, you know, who's, who's really trying to poke holes in just the fundamental nature of, of this business model? Um, no, I, it, it doesn't surprise me. I definitely think there's um, a lot of demystifying that needs to happen um, in this space. And discussions like this, of course, play a really important role on, in pushing that forward. But I want to push back against the iPhone analogy, because I think in this situation, we're talking about something that's much more akin to video on demand, where you, know, you have a number of offerings. You have Amazon Prime, you have Netflix, you have Hulu. Each one of those situations, is, is it a luxury product? Maybe. Um, it depends. And it depends on what the cost calculus the consumer is making between that and staying with their cable plan or using some other means in order to access media is, which is really similar to how this functions. We're both competing with someone's laziness as well as um, the uh, our, our competitors in terms of their penetration in a specific area. But simultaneously, you know, if, if we're hyper focused only on you know, what the density is, we're going to miss out on both consumers and restaurants that are looking for ways to be able to access this, particularly in ex-urban communities. Because even in the ride sharing space, yes, urban areas always had taxis, but when you got out to the suburbs or you got out to rural communities, it was incredibly difficult to get a ride when you needed it. And there were individuals that were looking for opportunities to work. So you had both of these areas where there's, there's a need and there's a way to meet that need. The question really becomes how you are subsidizing one versus the other. And that requires, I think, more than anything else, thoughtfulness and not necessarily, um, you know, having, uh, I, I, I think for us, we're, we're hyper focused on making sure that we are driving enough efficiency in our urban communities to be able to make it work in those other locations as well. So Mark, Mark, what do you think about about this debate? Do you do you do you fall more on Vignesh's side or, or Peter's side, or do you see, uh, you know, do you see elements of both arguments that you agree with? Well, what uh, you know, Vignesh was talking about with um, trying to make let's see, with trying to make um, uh, uh, you know having some of your uh, uh, revenue sort of um, uh, uh, supplement others where you have where you can have drivers and you can have certain um, uh, deliveries where, you know, maybe uh, the platform, you know, makes less on certain orders in order to, you know, subsidize or be able to, you know, in my perspective, be able to pay the drivers a little bit more for a specific delivery that's not, um, you know, that's doesn't bring in as much, as much revenue. Where, you know, I think as a driver, I'm just looking to make, you know, a certain amount of money you know, every hour. And I don't care if it's one delivery and I don't, I'd prefer it's not four or five deliveries, but um, which can get really busy. But, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, one delivery an hour, three deliveries an hour, I'm, you know, looking at it from a time perspective. And I want to make sure that I'm earning a certain amount, um, you know, on, a, on an hourly basis. And I think, you know, there's certain orders where, you know, I know I'm going to, you know, I, my um, earnings aren't always going to be consistent you know, on a delivery basis, I'm going to have some orders where I make $13, um, you know, for 20 minutes of work, which is out, uh, amazing. And there's some times where I kind of get stuck with a 40 minute order and I only make $7. So I think there's a lot of ability within the platforms to be able to, you know, take some of the um, earnings from, you know, from certain deliveries and be able to kind of subsidize that out. And in my experience, you know, with, you know, several thousand deliveries with, with DoorDash, um, you know, I've been able to kind of see that happen, but I'm always concerned that, um, you know, the supply and demand of, um, of delivery with um, the amount of orders out there, that it's almost like a reverse, uh, a reverse um, auction where, you know, the, the driver who will do a, do a certain job for the least amount of money is the one who's going to, you know, get picked. And so uh, I just, I just find it really challenging to find more, um, you know, especially during a pandemic to find more um, ability to earn more money, you know, on an hourly basis. I just don't know how much blood there is in that stone, you know. I see. Yeah. And, and Jane, Jane Diamond asks that she says it sounds like higher efficiency or more deliveries per hour is great for the platforms, not as good for the couriers. And maybe they're working harder for the same pay or not 
not more pay. I think that you do get more pay. So I don't think there's a, Yeah, right? if I may say that, and I see that I see the question here. Um, you know, when you, you know, from my perspective, when I'm, you know, my time, it's, you know, from the time I get the delivery to the restaurant, when I'm at the restaurant, and then delivering to the customer, there's sort of three parts to it. And if I get multiple deliveries, which I, you know, which I enjoy at all I, I, on behalf of drivers, we all enjoy those. So if I go to a certain, you know, street that has a lot of restaurants on it and, you know, I can go to the Chinese restaurant here and then two doors down is the sushi and then two doors down is the Mexican restaurant and I can pick up all three, which is fairly rare, but it happens. Um, you know, I'm eliminating that drive to the restaurant portion of my delivery, you know, for two of those, um, for two of those deliveries and I'm going to make, you know, more money uh, when I do that. And so, and that's just a matter of, you know, cutting down the time to, you know, for each delivery over the, over the, the course of my career as a spreadsheet nerd, um, you know, I've calculated that I, it's 1.8 deliveries per hour is my average over my, uh, over my time. Um, so yes, we do want more deliveries, which will give us, you know, more tend to give us more earnings per hour. Um, so we do appreciate that, but it's not, necessarily guaranteed but um we'll cert we'll certainly take it so uh christina berta jones uh pushes back on big nesh's uh video on demand analogy um saying uh saying she doesn't quite quite agree with it and i wonder if peter um if, if you have anything more to say on this front uh and, and i have sort of a follow-up question um but I, i'm just curious you just heard uh, Big Nash talk and Mark, what what's your what's your response to all of this? I mean, I just really want the math to sink into people because you know I think there's a lot of uh, clouding that seems to happen in the valley around these things, and it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, let's go with the number that you know uh, the the delivery companies are reporting, which I think is two point two deliveries an hour. If uh, you're paying people twenty bucks, right? Uh, there's close to $8 of delivery cost in your meal. Uh, let's just be honest about what that means for the average customer, right? It's not something that they're willing to go. And I see a comment here uh, about pizza, burgers, you know, fast food yeah. is the classic example of it. If you wanna look around the ecosystem of what people are eating in the United States and why they're doing that, uh, it's not because people prefer to uh, to create health problems down the road by eating uh, burgers and fries that are extremely unhealthy, uh, it's because of the price, right? That's the reality of American society. And uh, it's the same exact case here. You're adding $8, you're pricing out a lot of people from that uh, from that service. So and, and, and you mentioned, uh, you mentioned the health health aspect and maybe Kelly can can talk about this too. Uh, I, I did notice there are some comfort food brands that you that you work with as part of uh, the virtual dining concepts. Um, this is something that I, I've, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic when I was, I think there's even some data d disclosed from various platforms on comfort food being very in demand. And uh, that seemed, you know, not ideal given that, uh, you know, the, 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 I think the hope is that as a society, we would be healthier so that we can survive the pandemic better. Um, whereas a lot of the food that's being delivered is like not exactly healthy, a lot of fast food. Um, and, uh, and that seems to be like, I don't know, I don't know if that's like a top of mind issue, um, but it's certainly something I've been, I've been wondering about. Um, Kelly, what's your, what's your view on this? Yeah, I mean, from a, I think from a fast food standpoint, um, I do agree that, you know, from a pricing structure, um, sometimes those options are a little bit more affordable. So people are, you know, perhaps that's why they lean that route. Um, it could also be, you know, you're sitting at home and that's the comfort food. It's the same reason why you see spikes uh, during games and you see it during, uh, you know, Friday, Saturday nights, you see that sort of spike in those comfort food levels. Um, so. I, I mean, I, I understand that perspective. Um, I would say that's sort of the reason why we, um, in looking at restaurants and some of the brands that we're looking to put forth is giving some of these restaurants that perhaps are only those fast food options, um, the opportunity to expand into some of those healthier options um, so that they too can get a piece of the pie and to increase that number of offerings on those platforms. Um, because it's definitely an opportunity when you're scrolling through any of those platforms 
for now. Uh, typically, you, the pizzas, the wings, the those fast food options are the first ones that you sort of see um, from you know the popularity perspective. I think you have to really seek out some of those healthier options within those platforms. Um, from a fee perspective, I, I do sort of lean on the side of uh, you know. It, it is there's a cost to having some of those goods delivered and for some people they can definitely uh you know time is money on it um and it is something where if i can you know work an extra two hours at home without having to go out and get food delivered then yeah that 15 dollars fee whatever the fee may be is something that becomes worthwhile to me um and uh, do i think that some of that should go back to those couriers absolutely um you know the ones that are able to uh execute four orders in an hour or that can get one more order because now they're making 25 dollars an hour and they see the value in that um I, I do think there could be a greater push to make those drivers happier um and in speaking on behalf of all restaurants um lower commissions for us so i, I do think that there is a uh, you know a workability on that but at the end of the day there's um a profitability that is needed for that service that is a service that we all love to take advantage of and um, that is the Postmates, the Uber Eats, the Grubhubs and DoorDashes of the world. So, And uh, we, we've got our good friend Matt Newberg asking about how startups and platforms are starting to consolidate the making and selling of food through licensing uh, like your like your company, Kelly. And, and um, uh, I guess I didn't realize Postmates has a ghost kitchen in, uh, in Los Angeles. So maybe Vignesh can tell us how that's working. Uh, VKC is based in the Bay Area um, and, and just got a bunch of funding, a bunch more funding. Um, and Matt's asking, is this the best way to make the, the economics work? So, um, P Peter, I'm curious what you think about um, about these these efforts as well. I mean, I know what you think, Kelly, uh, of course, but um, Peter would love to know what you think about that. And Vignesh, if you could give us an update on your uh, your ghost kitchen in L.A., we'd love to we'd love to hear how it's going. So I think ghost kitchens play a, a, a very understandable role where we heard from Mark uh, that he's driving around to different restaurants, picking up food. When you're thinking about batching uh, certain item, uh, certain deliveries together, if you have to pick up from different places, that actually is impossible because just from a mathematical sense, it significantly decreases the probability of people ordering at the same time from the same place, right? Uh, so if you think about the economics of the business, it's, uh, it's a clever move. Uh, and now whether restaurants uh, uh, will at large opt to rent space from another company and, uh, you know, uh, pay even more of the little that's left for them to uh, another Silicon Valley company is, is an interesting question. Uh, we are seeing a lot of restaurateurs in the market pursue their individual strategy of identifying really, really cheap real estate around the city uh, and being able to execute on that way cheaper than uh, that what ghost kitchen, uh, what, what the ghost kitchen companies are offering. So, you know, uh, all of this is about access, right? And if companies come in and they basically buy up all the real estate uh, and cut the restaurant's access off, then uh, at least from a capitalistic perspective, they have a chance of succeeding. Now, if as a society that's what we want or not is a different question, but I think uh, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not going to get into it. Right but but you talk about real estate. Obviously, real estate prices have plummeted, uh, uh, you know, almost everywhere commercially. Um, and so some of these business models around, you know, having real estate in high priced locations. Um, you know, and, and helping helping you know these these virtual or delivery only brands. Maybe that's not as good of a value prop now, given that downtown LA or downtown San Francisco real estate is actually pretty pretty available uh, and, and plentiful. Um, is that is that also what you're what you're thinking about too? Look, I think the pandemic again is is a short term um, sort of thing that we're seeing right now. I wouldn't base my long-term bets on anything that the pandemic has brought around. There's certain trends that existed before that has been accelerated by the pandemic. I think those point towards uh, interesting aspects of how the world is moving in digital. You know, this panel uh, as an example and the software that we're using for it is a great example of it. Uh, we're just living in different places. It's impossible for us to execute on it. But when it comes to 
uh, commercial real estate and its uh, its long term value. Uh, the real estate markets go through cycles. People move to the suburbs, then they move back in the cities. You can look at Asian markets that had pandemics before and what happened to commercial real estate after. Uh, I don't think that uh, in the long term, commercial real estate is going to be in some huge trouble here in in downtown San Francisco. So I wouldn't base it on that. Uh, okay. My point was merely if uh, you're a delivery company that operates kitchens, now you own the customer, now you own the real estate, where is the restaurant going to go, right? Where should they open? Uh, and uh, when you create these kinds of um, uh, barriers to entering the market, uh, you can start charging and exploiting. And, uh, and I think that's exactly the plan here. And, and uh, so, Vignesh, uh, definitely let us know about your ghost kitchen. We have a couple of questions for you as well about portable benefits. Um, and uh, I'm trying to see who uh, who asked that first. But there was a question about um, – so Nick followed up. Uh, let's see. It was Jimmy Thompson. Got it. Got it. Yes. Um, so he, he's asking about these portable benefits, which I assume he – I assume he's talking about something much broader and more fundamental than the uh, top 22 offer, if you will, that, that Postmates and, and everyone else is, is, is bringing to the table there. Um, and, and then the follow-up question is who, uh, who's responsible for those, for those costs. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I don't know if you can answer both those questions briefly, but that's. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep it real quick, but um, in, in the, uh, in, in the ghost kitchen, virtual kitchen space, I, I, don't really see it so much as trying to um, supplant or push out of the market the um, traditional restaurants. Like here, this is really an area of need for restaurants that are considering an additional location, but don't necessarily have the capital to be able to invest, to be able to meet that additional capacity that they're looking for. So we actually have one right up the street for me. Uh, we have a takeout location for Homeroom, which is a mac and cheese restaurant. And then they have a permanent location as well. And they're actually a block away from each other. They're running two different kitchens and they run all of that themselves. But one of them effectively functions like a virtual kitchen, right? They're only doing takeout orders from there and they own the space and they like to have it set up that way so that their point of sale systems aren't interfering with their in-house in dining. But additionally, because you know, in many of the locations that you may have a ton of demand, downtown LA is a great example, commercial rents tend to be really high already. So if you have the ability to be able to augment your existing delivery flow from your location in Pasadena or in Santa Monica, where you already have uh, a, a location with this additional sort of part-time space to in order to, to fill in the gaps in demand, you know, it, it, I think there's a value proposition there for restaurants that really does make sense. And it, and it makes sense for us to be able to enable them to share that space with other other restaurants as well. Um, to respond to the portable benefits question, this one is an interesting one because it speaks to some of the labor issues that I brought up before. But there's two reasons why portable benefits have not been offered or benefits sort of traditional benefits have not been offered by platforms. One of them is that um, the traditional test for whether someone's an employee is triggered by the provision of benefits. So if you're offering someone benefits, you're treating them like an employee and it triggers employee status. So businesses get reticent to do that without some sort of intervention. The other part of this is if a number of businesses decide to do this together, say um, we did this with a, with a DoorDash or with Lyft, there's a little bit of an antitrust problem there because we are now all in concert working on the benefits that are offered to certain workers. So we need legislative interference to create a framework that's workable there. Um, so that's really what we're looking for. And there was broad alignment between industry and organized labor on this point up until AB5 was passed last year. And I urge folks to actually look up this, uh, look up a piece um, that uh that that discussed this that was called common ground for independent workers which was signed on to by folks uh including the the ceos of lyft and um seiu and jobs with justice and other organizations there there was a pretty broad consensus on it i think unfortunately um the worker advocates had a lot of leverage in blue states and industry had a lot of leverage in red states and no one wanted to give anything up so now you know ab5 was really a shot across the bow and we still have this we, we have an opportunity now to try and build something new. The question is whether we're going to seize on that opportunity or not. Okay. Uh, in terms of, um, so I've heard the word subscription come up from, uh, from Uber in particular. I think Nelson Chai was talking about the idea of 
the kind of bundle or subscription of on-demand services, um, you know, including food and other things. Um, obviously, all these big delivery platforms are essentially all going to end up doing or offering the same stuff. I mean, everyone's getting into convenience store items and groceries, and everyone's basically going to try to give you everything to your front door. Um, and I sort of wonder what the implications of that are. Um, so if, if any of you have thoughts there, that's something I'd love to, to think through. Um, whether that means there's going to need to be more consolidation um, since, since these, you know, these things are going to overlap more and more. I forgot to mention GoPuff uh, is another one to watch. The, their business model is slightly different since they own inventory. Um, uh, but that's something I, I was hoping to, to, to ask you guys about. Um, uh, yeah, what, what, what are your thoughts there about this like expansion of the types of products that all these delivery apps have? Um, and this idea that you could potentially bundle like ride hailing with food or some other types of services. Um, does that make any sense whatsoever? I'm happy to comment on that. I think uh, from an economics perspective, one of the important metrics that uh, our companies look at is uh, average order value, right? Uh, the sweeter the order value is, ultimately the easier it is to make the economics of a single delivery work. And obviously the economics of the single deliveries is the, the sum of those things is what makes the whole sort of ecosystem operate. So um, there's, uh, it's, it's obvious why uh, our companies tend to look at other sort of complementary goods that we can sell along in the same delivery that makes sense for the consumer uh, to buy together. The risk in that is uh, that if you can't make your business work without the other, uh, ultimately, that means that your space of competition is larger than you think. Um, the other companies that are now delivering the complementary goods that are necessary for your business model to work uh, have a chance to replicate what you do. Uh, and as a result of that, your probability of success and your expected value as a result of that investment in that, uh, in that firm uh, goes down. So uh, I think that's sort of the double-edged sword of opportunity and risk. Uh, in this particular question. But I think part, part of this is also that there are relatively few companies that do have a path to your front door. Um, Amazon being one of them, but you have you know these delivery and ride hailing companies as well. Um, we haven't talked about Instacart, but they're, they're, they're pretty big and you know able to function profitably as well. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, um, it, it, you're, you're just saying that, you're just, sorry guys, I forgot to, <laughs> Or not my notifications. You're, you're just saying that when you try to take on too much, you know, like th that's a that's a massive risk to, to try to think that you can uh, uh, offer everything to everyone and and, and actually execute. And in, that, in, in particular, I would call out that to me, uh, when companies kind of move on from their core product and trying to make that work uh, economically to other shiny things saying, oh, no, no, it's going to be the next thing that will make us work. Uh, it's usually a bad sign, right? If you look at companies like Amazon, uh, they never really had to raise prices on things. If anything, things got cheaper on Amazon over time, uh, which is uh, a sign of sort of a good business to be in uh, versus uh, the story of Uber, uh, where uh, everybody got promised that we won't have to buy cars ever again. And I remember I was one of those students at UCLA at the time, taking $5 rides from UCLA to downtown. And I was really excited because it is a pain to own a car. Uh, but that's no longer true. And so now I own a car. Understood. Understood. Uh, looks like we lost Big Nash uh, for, for, for a second anyway. But, um, but, but Mark, what's your, what's your thought on this like bundling idea? Um, do, do you feel like it makes sense for you to do different types of, of, of things? Well, personally, uh, you know, I, I specialize, you know, some, when I was hearing Peter talk, I, I, you know, I was thinking of if you specialize in everything, you specialize in nothing. Um, and, uh, you know, what I like to do is, is I enjoyed the deliver. I, I enjoyed delivering food. Um, and it worked, you know, there's a variety of different, you know, things that you can do here sort of on, on the, on these platforms, but, you know, I have a little tiny car, it's not particularly clean and and um you know i just specialized in it's easy for me to get in and out of parking spots to pick up food and 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 go deliver 
Um, I have tried, um, you know, I did work with, um, you know, Instacart uh, for a while and it's actually, and, um, you know, going out and not only, you know, doing the deliveries, but actually going through, uh, you know, the aisles of a grocery store and trying to find the eight ounce low fat, um, you know, sizzling ranch, you know, dressing is, uh, it's actually really, it's actually really hard. Um, or it's a, a lot more challenging and it's, it's a lot more uh, difficult than, uh, than simply picking up, you know, an order of chicken enchiladas and, and you know, sending them to someone's house. Um, you know, I'd also driven ease um, for, for a short time. And, you know, it's really whatever, you know, you like to do, if you like to, you know, drive people around and have, you know, conversations or not have conversations, um, you know, you might want to consider, you know, Uber or Lyft, um, you know, it just worked out for me. Um, my personal tastes of, uh, of delivering food. So um, there's a lot of room out there for a variety of different uh, different deliveries. Um, and you just kind of pick the one that, that's best, but, you know, don't do it as a career. And, and Kelly, I, I, uh, we're getting to five minutes left. So if anyone has, has questions from uh, the folks that are listening, uh, now, now's the time. But Kelly, I was going to ask, um, I meant to ask you earlier, you know, you – you're you're obviously working with restaurants and then um, presumably also helping them connect to, to the delivery sources of demand, uh, the delivery apps and the, and the sources of demand for the virtual kitchen goods that 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 they're um, they're creating or, or, or making. Um, do you have a preference on like how do you differentiate between the delivery apps today? What is the meaningful difference? And again, like we're just seeing continued consolidation. Caviar used to be standalone, no longer. Big Nash used to be, you know, standalone with Postmates, soon, no longer. Um, what does that What does that mean? What does that mean for leverage for your customers, uh, the, the restaurateurs, if they deal with these delivery apps? Isn't it going to make it a little bit harder on the commission side? And and how do you how do you just think about the the, the companies and and uh, differentiate between them? Yeah, um, I, I think it's really important that uh, a lot of the companies and the neighborhoods that they've sort of blossomed in, um, you know, they have a sp very specific customer base. Um, you know, they've gone out and the customer acquisition plans that some of these smaller companies have had, um, they have that very sort of, uh, I guess you could say, dedicated customer base. Um, and so it's important that, it, you know, and while it is difficult from a restaurant's perspective, you can't alienate any of them. Um, you know, it's really important that you're you know, actively choosing to work with these partners and find out, you know, the different nuances of what makes them tick and what makes their customers tick. Um, because then I think you learn more about your customers that way as well. Um, you know, if for some reason on Postmates, everybody's always ordering extra cheese, but on, uh, you know, DoorDash, they're always ordering the burger, you, you start to question it and it helps you learn more about your brand. Um, so I think it's really important that regardless of, uh, you know, sort of their, uh, you know, not regardless of, but their fee structures and um, whether they're handing you a tablet or a printer or POS integration, um, it's important that you're taking the time to sort of review them as a restaurant owner and operator. Um, the solution that sort of virtual dining concepts is bringing to these restaurants is that we're going to sort of handle all of that for you um, because you're you're owning your own current restaurant. Um, and we don't want you to take your eyes off the prize from that perspective. Your core brand is what's most important. And this is just supposed to be an added on sort of supplement to that in sort of the easiest way possible. Um, and in our eyes, it's important, again, to view sort of all of those different delivery partners because um, they all have different fan bases and different reasons why their customers choose them, so. Okay, well, we're, we're, we're pretty much at the end here. So if, if uh, any of you speaking uh, have any questions for one another or, or any, any other point that you'd like to make, um, uh, I, I do always enjoy when there are still unresolved issues, questions, and an industry is still young enough that there's a lot more to play out so it's, it's always very fun for me as an observer um but uh but yeah if, if anyone else has any other other comments now's the time uh, i if i may um i enjoyed the conversation about about ghost about you know the ghost kitchens and you know i haven't been driving for the last six months due to you know i'm lucky and i was able to take some time off once uh covid you know hit here here in the bay area mid-march um, the idea of going, of driving to a dedicated, um, you know, food, uh, you know, food preparation location where I don't have to fight with, um, 
you know, I don't have to compete for parking spaces or traffic, you know, with uh, those who are there, you know, for a sit down meal. And I can just kind of roll through and I become, you know, familiar with, with the area. You know, that's something that drivers, you know, you become a better driver when you're familiar in an area where, you know, where to park, you know, what the traffic patterns are like, et cetera. And so, you know, a ghost kitchen from a driver's perspective, all I can think about is, you know, I, what if it's a drive through and I don't have to get out of my car? I don't have to park. I don't have to walk two blocks. Um, you know, it's really nice from my perspective. And, you know, just as a as a consumer, I don't sometimes I feel like it's not really in competition with, you know, I don't know if people are choosing between having a meal at home and deciding to go out. It almost seems like there's an entertainment factor and sort of a, a different social factor with, you know, going out to eat somewhere. Or maybe it just seems like a fever dream here, you know, in COVID. But, um, you know, versus I just need to be convenient and I'm going to stay home tonight, you know, and I'm going to stay home. So I, I don't know how much, again, from a consumer perspective, how much of a real um, fight that is, you know, if you're making, you know, uh, food specifically for takeout versus, you know, the, yeah. the in-restaurant experience. No, that's a very, very good point. If I may, I, I, I'd like to add on to Mark's because I, I'm in agreement here. Actually, that's a lot how our company works. Uh, we have a hub. Uh, from which we distribute all the food. Uh, so at the time that the driver is picking up, uh, you're just picking up everything together from a single location. And it comes with another benefit as well, which we tend to forget about. Uh, food in particular, but generally business, is about building relationships with your customer, right? And at the front line of those relationships are drivers, uh, like Mark used to be before the pandemic, and ultimately, the fact that every time some new person comes to your door is actually a disadvantage uh, to a lot of these companies because uh, you cannot build a relationship uh, with your driver. You can't build a trusting relationship. And uh, as a result of that, the experience that you have is, is way worse. And so that's a particular aspect of our business that consumers really enjoy. Okay, well, we, we've hit time. Um Awesome to meet you guys um, and, 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 and Kelly and, and yeah, thanks for, for the time. And um, I guess if you are watching this, you can click the leave button and there are lots of other sessions going on. So please stick around for, for everything else that's coming up in this event. And um, yeah, thanks for the conversation. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Nice to meet you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Bye.